Ai steppi! Ai steppi! Ai And of course we want to thank our guest uh, Rafael Zuber for being here with us tonight. And welcome to the last of conference of the first semester, the winter semester. Uh, so, Rafael Zuber, we know him in academia, he made a, an atelier in 2009 here, a very successful atelier about important buildings was the theme. It was quite su successful, now there's even a publication, a really beautiful book. I the company Consiglio and Ravedello. <laughs> so he has also taught in Bern in 2006. He has written for important magazines of architecture like TG. Uh, we wanted to call him because he's really rough in a way of showing architecture, not only in the expression, really clean plans that show a really clear texture of geometry. It was really interesting. It's we, we saw somehow some interpretations of the geometrical concepts brought by Khan. This really clean way of showing architecture. So we were really attracted by the way he's making architecture in Northern temporary language. So now the floor is yours. Thank you once again. Thank you. Here you enter a door here on the right. Also here you see 
strange things. The first room you enter, it's a wedding chapel. Also here, everything out of brick. That's how you enter the church space, over a corner. It's a squared space, and you enter over a small door in a corner. And you see here that, you, yeah, probably you don't see it, but the floor is going down a little bit to the altar. The altar is here, and it's, the floor down here is about 55 centimeters sunken down into the earth. So from here to here, you walk down. Also here, everything in brick, even the roof. Even the altar is in bricks. These benches here, everything brick. And what you also see is this, this strange roof construction, these this rough uh, steel beams that support the whole roof. This is the back baptismal font directly at the entrance before we look from here downwards you see how the windows look from inside there are very few windows it's very dark in this space and that means that when you enter at the beginning you almost don't see anything you need some time till your eyes get adapted to this dark and then these small holes in the walls they, are, they produce a light that is very sharp in your eyes and, uh, and that, that create also this, this very rough uh, atmosphere in this building that you don't see a frame, it's really just a hole in the wall and it's because you don't see a frame of the window it, it's almost like a room this is the altar completely out of brick but the bricks here are not Led horizontally like the walls, for example, but they are turned behind the green so that the altar gets more massive. This is a chair here, out of bricks also. This is the view from downstairs, from down there, from, from the altar. You see the small windows, <coughs> roof construction, and you also see here that. Here there's a stripe of light. This is coming from a top light that is above here. <coughs> here now we can see very well that the floor is sloping down towards the altar. And we also see that the pillar is not symmetrical. This part here is cantilever and it's longer than this here, slightly longer. And this window is exactly in the center of, the, of this facade. This is outside between the church space and the, the economical building where there are uh, secretary spaces, uh, meeting spaces for the community. So this, this is a detailed view to, to give you an impression of the, of the construction. You see, everything is, is really rough, the glasses are just attached at the holes with these small steel, uh, steel pieces. The doors are also attached at the walls. There is nothing hidden here. It's everything very direct. After being there, I wanted to, <coughs> to know more about this building and I was looking about drawings or plans to, to study it and to, to get the glue to, to understand this building, to understand why I was so attracted about it. And I couldn't find any drawing by uh, barns from the wind and from, from snow. So this is kind of a, a similar scheme. <coughs> the church building is protected by this building here and by these trees. <coughs> this is a view on the roof. <coughs> we see here that there are 
different, very different roles with different geometries that sometimes are, are very strange also. The building on the, this roof here, for example, is straight, here, like this. This is a part, this is another level. Here again, uh, this is something else. This is the church room here, this square. These two top lights here. This is the clock bell, uh, the, the clock tower. And this is the main entrance here in the, in the wedding chapel, then you have the church space like this. The main entrance for ceremony is here, small room. Again, we enter from here, go down a little bit, and then it goes up again here through this door, the wedding chapel, with a waiting room and toilet, and then we enter here, this wall that gets thicker in the church space. It's very dark. This pond here that we saw before is constantly dropping water in a very slow rhythm. There's always one drop after the other. And this creates an atmosphere of eternity somehow. That it's, it's, very, it's very calm in this space, and this drops dropping down. You hear them everywhere. <clears throat> and it's, it's almost like you don't feel the time going in anymore. It's, it's eternal. This is the pillar here that supports the whole roof. Perfect square. This here are the sacristan spaces where the priest would prepare and then come out through this door. There's another door here that goes out. One window, another one, and these two windows here. These here are the office spaces. Space for the priest, the secretary, and so on. This is a meeting space. These are also meeting spaces, and this is a very big public meeting space for, uh, for Sunday afternoon meetings or so. Now, here there are some, some very interesting things. I, I will tell you some of them. One is, for example, that the problem of the square. How do you organize a square? The square is probably, after the circuit, probably the most difficult geometry to organize because there's no direction, there's no hierarchy in it. This pillar here is not in the center of the square. The center, as I said before, is exactly here on the axis of this window. This here. And the pillar is set back a little bit. So this produces different, uh, different zones already in this, in this space. We, and creates an orientation towards the altar here, or towards this wall. Then the sloping floor that is going down from here to here is 55 centimeters, always also creates a direction towards the altar. Then this door here, where the priest enters, is exactly on one axis with this door, and with this fireplace here. And the two top lights that we saw before, they are here, also on this axis. That means that when the priest comes out in this dark space, he uses to have a white, uh, to be dressed white, and coming out under these top lights uh, makes him appear almost like a god, or almost like something supernatural. It's very impressive to see this, this, uh, this light person under this, under this top light. And then these two top lights are on another axis with these two windows here. That means <coughs> this spot here under the top lights where the priest comes out in the church room is the meeting point of an axis here and an axis here. Or we could also say it's the meeting point between fire, here sky, and water, and earth, of course. Like the four elements meet at the point where the priest enters the church space. In 
section, we see better that this pillar is not in the center. We also see the slope being lower. And we see now this part here, this cantilevering being longer than the one on the left. Why this? The roof, the highest point of the roof, is exactly here over the pillar. And now to hold the roof in a balance, of course, because that there is more load here coming down on this part, it has to be short to create a balance. It's an aesthetical reason that, uh, that creates this kind of distortion of this pillar, of this cantilever. And <clears throat> it's also a kind of a complicated construction. I mean, he could also have chosen to, to put four pillars of ten or much more. Uh, a more economical construction. But this act to bring all these loads down to one pillar in the end produces a cross. But it's not the Christian cross, the traditional Christian cross that we know, it's the so-called Andreas cross that is very uh, traditional in its region there in the Protestant church. And we can read it also as a symbol that it's the cross uh, holding the whole structure of the church, or the cross bear, carrying the, the church. I find this a very good aspect of this construction. And here you see the stop lines. This is a section in the other direction, with these walls. This is kind of the normal construction to to make a horizontal, uh, horizontal surface out of bricks, you have to make the uh, domes or vaults. They are carried by steel beams that are here, go in this direction, bring the loads on these two beams, then on this that we saw before, and finally down on the pillar. These two top lines bring lights down in the, in the two entrance spaces, the wedding chapel and the waiting room. That means that the whole like public part of the church space or of the church is completely out of brick. Floor, walls, and the roof, the ceiling. This is a view to the roof of the standing church or for the, the building look up. You see that these walls <coughs> are not parallel in the church space. They do a certain movement, and this also has constructional reasons to make the whole this, this surface or plane to make it stiff, so that by, with earthquakes or horizontal forces it cannot move. And it produces also a good acoustic in this space. If, if the walls would be regular, the, the sound would kind of always go, go further and uh, produce an echo, and like this it's broken. It's a very good acoustic space. You see these two beams going on in this direction, bringing the loads on this beam and finally on the pillar. Then you see also that in the economic building here, the roof is not out of bricks anymore. It's a simple wood construction. This section shows the meeting space, that is the most, uh, the most important private space of this, uh, of this uh, two buildings. It's where the priest would meet the uh, other market bricks. It opens now once to the church and on the other side to outside the park. If we look at the floors, the floors are out of bricks only in the church space. All the other spaces are done with tiles, ceramic tiles, in different colors and in different patterns. And it's now interesting to see how these patterns uh, develop. All around the building, outside here, it's gravels, with very small brown stones. Then, if we enter the building, we walk on these small stones. First we step on big plates or big tiles. We enter the first 
space, the tides are getting smaller, air on the bricks again smaller, and at the altar the bricks are turned by 90 degrees and it sits smaller again. The same happens in this building here, small graves and big stones, smaller stones, very small stones, big stones, smaller, 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 and in the end there's a pattern that is centralized, that is going around one point that makes a stone <coughs> there. The most private room has a pattern, a stable pattern of the floor. So it's, it's always the same system that goes through, through the whole building of the floors that, that are getting smaller, the more private the spaces are. We also see in the church space how the floors are done to, to sign where the chairs should, uh, should stay. You see this here, you see the pattern here. How do you do a pattern, for example, in a, in a room that is not a problem, you somehow have to adapt to it. So here is part, here. And the church space uh, was everything uh, drawn. I saw drawings at Leverman Street with this, with this floor patterns. How the bricks had to be left. All the others are done at the, at the side. See the big tiles here, they move over through the doors, there's another pattern. Here, smaller, smaller, here the other. Same here, gravel, big place, smaller, smaller. Here it's already centralized and here it's already centralized. <coughs> So this building, for, for me personally, is a, is a very important building. On one hand, of course, because, uh, because I know it very well, and, this, uh, and it has become by time a reference for, for everything I do, for everything I think. I always think back to this building because I really know that it's cool. And on the other hand, I think it's also a very important building because I'm very much interested in, uh, in, in a process or, or let's say in a point where, where uh, rational thinking comes to a point where it's not possible to be rational anymore, where you are kind of forced to make also intuitive or ir irrational decisions, like speculations. And I'm also very much interested in in logical way of thinking, so in, in the point of, especially from in the point where the logical thinking uh, forces or kind of naturally comes to, uh, to, to things that are not thinkable, that are kind of unthinkable, but when you radically think logical, it's, there's just one way left to do it. And this building, I think, is, is a good example. That, that all these things that, that seem to be very strange or, or non-logical in the end, when you think about it, there's, there's just one way to do it, and it's, it's a logical way, almost always. The second building I'm going to show you is a building that uh, just completed two months ago. <coughs> It's a school and kindergarten in a village called Grono. This is called, uh, very close to Bellinzoni. <coughs> uh, <coughs> with this building, uh, it was very important for us to bring the two functions together. The two functions like kindergarten and school. We didn't want to make just a school and then there's a kindergarten somewhere or the opposite. We wanted to do something or a building where both have the same importance. A building that is that, that creates a strong identity for kids in the school, but also for the kids in the kindergarten. <coughs> uh, 
this is the site. This here is the lot. There's one street here, another street leading down, and a smaller street here. So the lot is faced by three streets. It's in the center of the village, and this here is the town hall. The lot has a highest point up here and a lower point down here. There's a difference of about four meters. Uh, the building is uh, an exact square. <coughs> it's not oriented to one street or another. It's, it's slightly turned to, to not produce a higher it's not more oriented to this street than to this or this or even the dark here. Then the circle around this here is a wall, a wall that is 70 centimeters high that separates the two outside spaces. The kindergarten needs an own outside, outside space and the school needs another outside space. So this here is asphalt at the floor. It's the character of a public space and it's the it's the playground for, for the kids for the school. Inside of the circle here is a playground for the kindergarten and it has the character of a garden. It's like grass and, and, and gables and stuff. The entrance for the kindergarten is here. The entrance for the school is here. Here we enter in ground floor and here we enter in the first floor. <coughs> And the building is oriented exactly north-south of the diagonal. Now, this circle here is it's like a crater in the, in the, the situation, in the, in the landscape. And because the, the lot is sloping in this direction, inside here, it creates a, a, this crater that is very steep here in the back very flat or almost horizontal on this side here. In section we see this vector. This is the entrance to the kindergarten, the ground floor. This is the entrance to school that is up here, the classrooms. And here in between are public spaces like teacher space, like a library, an alamania, and uh, toilets. You also see that this bridge here has exactly the same pendants than here, once it goes up and once it goes down. And this defines also where the building is in section, like the, the, the height where it stands there. It's, it's put kind of in the middle of the lot in a way so that the two entrances have the same slope. There's a basement with uh, technical spaces and storage. <coughs> An elevator in the center and staircase also in the center. Ground floor. Now you see here that in the back it's much steeper than here. Here it's almost horizontal. We enter from here. This is a covered outside space. And this here is glass. This line. So all this here is the heated space. The thick parts here and this is the load bearing structure that is non-movable and everything are non-load bearing walls that we could also take out and arrange differently. So we arrive in this covered outside space, we enter here, go through a, through a space to leave the clothes to change. And then this here is a garden space that has the whole length of the building <coughs> with a storage room and some toilets. The same is on the other side, also here, the kindergarten classroom with storage and toilets. And this here is a main cell where they can eat lunch it's with a kitchen and also protected outside space. In the first floor, we enter from here, go up. It's covered outside space again. A big hallway 
the power line here, meeting space, a library, a computer space, and here the teacher space. These are my toilets. Again, the glass is here for the heated space. And this here is the playground for the kids. The top floor, here are the classrooms in the four corners, four classrooms. And in between, here and here, are uh, two rooms for, um, for handcraft work. <coughs> we also see here that each space has two windows, one here and one here. Window means it's, a, it's, it's an element that you can open to have fresh air. So that air can circulate like this, and it's always in the center of the space. It's really the center of this <coughs> This is the structure, and the structure, the low bearing structure, was very important in the sense that uh, <coughs> they didn't know yet how the how the school system will be developed in the future. It could be that they will have bigger classes or smaller classes and they have to, or we have to provide a building where it's possible to, to change again the inside spaces. So we tried to kind of reduce the structure, the load bearing structure on, uh, on a few points and to put it outside at the facade so that inside we have the biggest possible space without Cloth bearing elements. Uh, the size from here to here, one length is 24 meters and 80, almost 25 meters. And we have always one pillar in the center of each facade. This two and this two. Then there's the elevator that is low there, and this wall here that is low there. The whole structure is out of concrete. Uh, because we wanted to have entrances in the center of the building, the center of the facade, we of course had to make holes into these pillars. And this makes that the pillar is wider here. This is about three and a half meters. And this is just about two meters. This is a pillar that comes down like on one point. And that means that the building in this direction is not stable against horizontal forces. In this direction it's stable because this here stiffens the whole building. It's like if you stand like this, you are more stable than if you stand just like this. It makes the building rigid in this direction. That's why we introduced this wall here to make the building stiff also in this direction. And then the core here kind of makes a uh, balance between all these elements. So everything what is load bearing is, is really needed and it's, it's like a system where, where all the parts are dependent from each other. And of course we have to bring the force from, from these corners down on these points of the pillars. These are cantilevers of about 11 and a half meters. That's that's almost this place. It's, it's an enormous camp. This is a scheme from the engine here. We see here the entrance results, this and this with the holes, and these are the point pillars. This here is the, or are the forces, how they are from the corner from the building. They get more and more and more till here to the pillar. This now kind of defines the geometry of the structure <coughs> and the facade in the end. These lines that you see here, this should be a blue line, is a pre-compression cable that we put into the concrete <coughs> to, to hold the core, to put pressure on the corpse of the building so that they don't fall down. This is one system. It's like if you hold a sheet of paper like this and it's hanging through, then you put tension on it, it goes up in the center. Now here it's exactly the opposite effect because there's a pillar underneath. You put pressure on these two corners. The corners go up. 
This is one system, and the other system is that this geometry here is like one arch that is bent by 90 degrees. It means that an arch we know, as we have seen already before in, in the bricks, is one way to make a very huge span. So this arch together with these pre-compression cables work very efficiently to, to make this big cantilever. This is how the building looks like from the lowest points. You see the pillar that goes down on one point, the pillar with the holes inside for the entrances to the ground floor. You see that the concrete is a little bit brownish. We put some yellow and some black pigments in the concrete and we tried to, to reach the, the same color than the earth in this place. It's an earthy color of brown. Then everything what comes afterwards, everything what is not concrete, is put additionally inside the structure. It's like a shell, and then we put stuff in it. Different materials like wood, like bricks, like there are elements of steel, but all these, these materials are, are kind of brought together in, in the same tonality, in this, in this brownish color. These are the parts that you can open for ventilation. These are fixed glass. Are not, uh, it's not possible to open it. This is the, the outside, the playground for the school kids. This is a view from the other side. The building is almost sunk in, in this crate. You don't see anymore where it stands. It appears like a two floor building from here. Two story building. This is the entrance facade for the kindergarten. Go down this ramp here. This is the playground, this garden. And you see now the window frames that are put on the concrete. Mm -hmm. These elements there for ventilation. Here are elements for the, for the rainwater. The water just the, the rain can go here and then it flows. <coughs> you see now also that uh, these elements to open for ventilation, they are not kind of designed from outside, they are just the consequence of the organization of the spaces inside. They are always in the center of the spaces, and from outside it looks on the clothes, it's, it's a result. The, the concrete structure, this pre-compression cable that I mentioned, they start, for example, down here at this point, then they go up to the highest point here in the center and then down again here to the lowest point. They also make an arch. Uh, when, we, when we put them into the concrete, we had to, to let the concrete dry first for about 28 days. And then when it was a little bit hard, we put the pressure on, this, on these cables to, uh, to lift these corners. And it was amazing to see that these corners, they, they really went up five centimeters in about eight minutes. You could stand there and look at them, how they come. Uh, the geometry of these arches are quarter ellipses. The, like structurally, the idea of form of <coughs> geometry would be a parabola. But the uh, parabola was just a little bit too complicated to, to do on site for the craftsman. So we decided to, to change to the, to the ellipse. It is geometrically very close to the parabola, but it's, it's much easier to, to construct it, to do it. It's also always the same, exactly the same uh, ellipse, corporate ellipse. For the simple reason that, that the craftsmen could always reuse the framework, they did it twice. <coughs> and then they used it on each floor for each ellipse again. 
But now, because the middle floor is 30 centimeters higher than, than the other floors, and the pillars here are smaller than up here, for example, this geometry had to move, this ellipse had to move to, to, uh, to, to fit in this shape. You see, for example, that up here, the highest point of the ellipse is here in the corner. But down here, the highest point is about here. And here, it starts to go down again. So that means that the, the facade, or the, the expression of the, of the concrete structure of this building is, is the result of the very logical calculations of the engineer and kind of a composition of the architect. It's, it's, it's not a pure engineer work, it's not a pure composition, it's, it's a mix, it's something in between. The engineer told us the minimum that we need here, and he told us the minimum that we need here, and then we had to move this ellipse so that it, that it fits, that it works. <coughs> we love it. This here is the part where the toilets are behind this, and it's the only part that is we know, and this also. These are two parts of the buildings that are in concrete, but that are not load bearing. Everything else in concrete is load bearing structure. This is the entrance to the first floor, to the public space, to the public floor. This uh, geometry of the circle is, by the way, that the best geometry to kind of to, to make the forces flow around. Because forces are like, like water, they work in the same way. They, they usually take the, the shortest way you can take. So the round is very good to not have like breaking points of these, of these forces. This is load bearing, this is not load bearing. the corridor, the hallway, the first floor. You see here a wall that is not load bearing out of, out of bricks. <coughs> you see the, the doors that are uh, also very rough in MDF, just attached to the, to the walls. Here's the staircase out of concrete. The floor is also out of concrete in the same brownish <coughs> hole. This is the meeting space. We see just a fragment of this arch, of this uh, quarter ellipse here. And now, in general, from inside, from, from outside, we have this very strong picture from this, from this structure that you see as a whole. But from inside, you always just see a fragment of this structure. And you see these kind of naked elements that are, that are absolutely in itself organized and confront. And by seeing this fragment of, of the structure, that gives you a relation to the whole. <coughs> you always know where you are, you, you feel the same, you have a relationship to the whole. The ceiling is an acoustic ceiling that we developed on ourselves. We didn't have enough money to have a conventional uh, acoustic things, so we can have discussions that are simply screwed at the scene. <coughs> the staircase in front of you, it's one piece of concrete done, done in situ. Also the steps and everything. The handrails are out of steel and painted in this, in this brownish tone. Classroom. Here you see anyway these this elements to, for ventilation. It's like a door, two meters high, but it's in the fresh air. The other glasses are fixed. And you see now also that the, the windows or the glass is set back. It's not on the same uh, level than the concrete structure. There's 90 centimeters between the concrete and the glass. And by the effect now that, that what is inside of, of the structure is just put together additionally, you see down here the window frame, 
Up here, you don't see it anymore because it's hidden behind the acoustic insulation. So the limit of the space is up here is the concrete, is the structure. And the limit of the space down is the window frame that are on different levels. And I think this is something that produces like the, if it makes the space much bigger how you see it than it actually is in reality. And the turtle insulation, usually when we do buildings out of concrete, we have to use a double layer system or we have to we have to detach the floor plates, the slabs from the wall so that the insulation can go from up through the whole building without turning to the breaks. Here we didn't do this, slabs are running out from, from warm to cold. We just have a stripe of insulation up here, the ceiling, and we have uh, an insulation on the floor under this concrete that, uh, that produces a zone where cold and hot, the, where warm and cold is mixed. It's like one meter where inside and, and outside uh, climate meets and this is covered like in this one that we covered with the with this acoustic components. And then the geometry of this is just the, the amount of space that you need. The physician said we need a percent of, of the ceiling so we put the percent that's it. Also in this building it's it's very rough. It's very direct, everything, nothing is hidden except of this pre-compression cable and the, the installation, the water pipes and electrical pipes that are in the walls and in the slabs. Everything else is very simple to show. The walls, these walls here are out of bricks and then we, uh, we cover the bricks with uh, mortar, the mortar that is in between the bricks and the joints with a uh, panel. Brush. And if a brush we call it with the same material, this brick so it, it produces a unity in itself in the wall, and that it produces a unity also with the floor and ceiling and the concrete. <coughs> Kindergarten. This is a space where you can feel the whole depth of the of the building. We also feel it's enormous empty room here. These are sliding doors that you can open. When it's open, it covers this part here, and we can go out here and down. This is the back part where it's steeper here outside, the other part is <coughs> This is the mensa space to eat. And I think in this space, or in this picture at least, you, you can see very well how, how this building is, is fought and done additionally. You see these, these elements, these wooden elements, you see these panels, you see the lamps outside, you see the lamps inside, inside and outside is also mixed. We don't really, or it's, it's hard to see where it's inside and outside. It's, it's kind of all these, these naked elements that are put together to, to one piece, to one building. <coughs> the project that I want to show you is an office building that was a competition that we did this year, that we didn't win. <coughs> An office building is, of course, something that has to be very efficient, it should be too expensive, there are certain rules how it should work, and uh, let's see. We developed this building mainly out of two, of, of two aspects. One aspect is, is the rooms, the inside spaces that we, that we thought would be appropriate or good for offices 
and the other is, is the structure of the empire, the structure that works to make different separations, to make smaller and bigger offices and so on. Uh, the Roman Soria section, you see that the ground floor is, is a little bit down in the earth, and the other floors have windows that are, that are on the same level as the floors. Here, the window steps about 70 centimeters here, then the window goes up to, to the ceiling. Here it's the opposite, and here again it's the opposite. We had a limit of this height. That's the reason why it went a little bit down here. On the roof, there's a, a roof terrace here. Let's look at the door outside. This wall here is part of the structure, the triangle wall. <coughs> the structure is, uh, is not fought in, in concrete again, but it's a double layer system. There's an inside system, that is this, it comes down here, pillars that are supporting the slabs, and there's an outside system, that is this one here. In between there's a thermal insulation. The outside system has the only function to protect the insulation. That's it. It doesn't have load-bearing uh, functions. It, it's just load-bearing itself and protecting the insulation. The pillars, the other pillars inside on this area here are supporting the floors, the slabs. This is a floor plan, an empty floor plan of the structure. Inside there are three walls. This is like the minimum of walls that, that we need to to make the building stable. Two walls in one direction, this is this, and one wall in another direction. If these three walls don't meet in the same point, the building is stiff against torsion and against horizontal forces. Then there's a grid, these pillars here, that are supporting the slabs. It's a grid of, I think, about seven half meters. It's just a very economical grid slabs that are not too, uh, not too thick, not too heavy, and that allow a good, uh, good organization of the floors. Then these two walls, this and this, that, that create the, the core of the building, with elevated uh, toilets, staircase and so on, is not in the center. And this is for the reason that we could make a hall with a corridor over here, and have office spaces on both sides. That's why we move this core out of the center of the building. Then outside, you see these very thin pillars here. They are 15 centimeters, and they are supporting the facades. The, the, the concrete facade that is also just 15 centimeters. This is, this is very, very thin for concrete. The pillars inside are 25 centimeters, I think. So these two walls are stiffened in the building in this direction, and this wall is stiffened in this direction and against the rotation, <coughs> and the pillars take the vertical forces. What we also see here is that this pillar in the corner stands under the wall, under the facade. The other pillars outside, these ones, because they, they stand beside. It means they are attached to the facade. This is a possible organization of the floor plan. Because the core is not in the center, it creates also different zones. There are, it's possible to make offices here in this part that are more intimate, where you have to walk through the core to reach them. There are others that are more public, but in general, there are lots of solutions to organize it. This is the facade. It looks very boring. And you see now the, the, like the, the result of this, this structure. Inside structure we don't see, it's very regular. But then we see ground floor, first floor, because once the windows are 
higher, this almost like one floor. Then there's kind of a beam here, kind of a bigger beam up here. These are the thin pillars, the 15 centimeter pillars, that are attached at this high beam and at this low beam. And here are the small pillars that stand below the facade that stop here, which stop here. <coughs> also this is not going on. And this is now because this here is a beam that is about, I think, 1 meter and 20 in height. That means that the span that is possible to do with this small beam is not very, uh, not very long. That's why we need more pillars here. This here is a beam with a very high height that can take a lot of movements. That makes that we need just two pillars up here and one the other side. So this is kind of the result of, of the minimum structure that we need. And this is how it looks now. This is this triangular wall inside. And it looks like almost random or, or, or messy or whatever. We don't really know why it looks like this. But if you start to study and if, if, you, if you understand something about about structure, about architecture, you can kind of find out why it is, how it looks like. This here is a road that connects the new building to other buildings, with a horizontal element here to protect against rain, vertical elements to protect against wind. The attached pillars here, these Five pillars are supporting this part. These two and this are supporting this upper part. And the pillars inside, thicker ones, this, this for example, they are supporting these legs. So it's two different systems. One inside that is uh, stiffening the building, also against horizontal forces. Then like an envelope that is just protecting against rain that is hold from the inside structure. This is the entrance, how we approach the building. You building was formed in a blue concrete. A concrete with blue pigments in, in the concrete. And uh, blue is the, the most rare pigment that exists. That makes it also the most expensive. Thank you. Dialectically, we would have done this internal walls out of 
amount of wood, for example, or steel to show it's something else. And I much more, or, or in this building, I was much more interested to create the unity out of everything. To also to treat the bricks in a way that they come by, by how they look like, but also as, as an idea that they come close to the concrete. For example, in these brick walls, Usually in Switzerland, when we do brick walls, we have the horizontal joints that are one centimeter, and the vertical joints are 1.5 centimeters. And that creates a pattern that is very regular. And this regularity has something modular and something cold, is an expression. And we told the craftsmen that they are, that they are not allowed to cut any bricks in this building. That means that they couldn't work modern, but they had to, to adjust the joints. Sometimes the joints are just 0.5 centimeters, long. sometimes it's only 15 centimeters. And this, on one hand, makes this, the, the character of these walls, uh, let's say, warm or whatever, warm than something that is modern. And these walls come closer to the idea of concrete. Concrete is also a mass that is poured with, with, um, with pieces inside, with stones that are blocks. And these walls now are kind of something similar. It's, it's a mass of more blocks. I mean, if you say you're not interested in extending kind of didactic logic all the way to kind of lots of conclusion. <coughs> Why would we say that reverence is that actors break down? Because clearly, at some, at some point, he's, he's acting in an incredibly logical way. I mean, for a lot of point years ago, I had to start thinking of found in studying that. Yeah, this is something. I mean, he's working very logically in the sense that, that in the end, almost everything is understandable how he does it, or the decisions that he does. But of course, if you, if you work logically, or, or if you systematically also, and rationally, you will always come to a point where, where there's no answer, where you have to, to risk something, to do something out of your belly, or, or, uh, or to make a speculation. And this is what, what I think Clarence did. For example, this, this, this symbolic of, of this cross. Of course, it's not. I mean, we can understand how it is, but, but this idea to do this, this is not something mathematical. This is this is a, an irrational speculation to produce the symbol of this cross. But then it's done in a logical way. It's done out of the construction and the logical. Can you say that reverence is your master? Or 
Miguel, mi other master, maestro.
but also to the group. And uh, I mean, for my work, I'm, I'm not interested to, to work with references or, or somehow copy from ancient times or whatever. I think it's much more interesting to, to work out of, um, out of our conditions in our time and produce something that has a meaning in our society. And I think that every, everything that has been done or what is done today is, uh, is part of its epoch, of its, of its time. So uh, I'm more interested in developing architecture. I'm much more interested in it today than Um, I have a question. Why did you choose blue concrete? <laughs> because I have in this building. Blue concrete? Yeah, because I, I had the same dilemma with my developer. Green and blue. You have the same one? Okay. The same question in my project. Which color? To yeah, because I had red, green and blue. <laughs> <laughs> so at the end I thought about that. Green and red is something that we have in in uh, the habitative nature and blue now. So then I think I was why blue. Yeah, blue is, is, is very seldom in nature. I said it's it's the most rare pigment. Yeah. And this uh, of course also has the aspect of something that is very artificial. It was a completely different approach. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> The following that question, what's your approach to the context once you visit the new site? How do you how do you deal with the historical part of it? Because you had really clear layouts and plans, and how does it relate to the nature, to the context, to the place? I mean, when I when I start the building or the project, I always try to make a building that works in this place where it will be. Like functionally works, let's say. The entrance is at the right place and so on and stuff. But uh, if I come to, to your question, maybe also in yes. this, what about the this context, I, I would say also there I'm not interested to kind of copy like stylish elements of, of the facade of a neighbor building or something like this or, or to adopt my building to the proportions of other buildings or, or stuff like this. I think this, is, this, this doesn't make sense because often, I mean, we have to be honest. I mean, we have to say that there are not very much really good buildings, good architecture. So why should we adopt to bad buildings? I go very straight to the point. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Something that is, that is strong, that has, a, that has a certain impact, that also makes, makes the other thing. In that moment, this work, to detect some nostalgia. I mean, you talk about architecture, or it should always be up to the top. And means, was able to make architecture at the Z-Pod, because of the scale. You know, how the Spirit is body and whatever, but it also scale. It's beyond the personal architecture, where everyone's has to be on the side of it, and everything that's brick being placed. And we wanted to use bricks, so and kind of, these kind of round shop of bricks. Do you see any kind of nostalgia, or um, kind of too much of an obsession with an old craft, rather than new technology, in the work of levels and the people? 
when you put him in, in, in his period, in his time, in the time that he works. Yeah, I would say this, this, this love or this interest for craftsmanship was, was something that was then, at that time, more alive. Or today, it's, it's just in some some particular niches of architecture that this is that there is an interest. At this time, he for sure was very interested in this, and I think in general, he was a big interest in this. By the way, he had gone so after the war, he didn't have any work for I think it was 40 years, and he started uh, uh, manufacturing for for those. And also means his craft was more it was more contemporary than that one. So he um, I, I mean I can't imagine that but it's making an interesting big building. But I can you know I can see how these big buildings are fascinating. It just seems uh, maybe it's a matter of the age that they were at that time when they kind of practice at when they practice at the same time maybe that one is um, was too old. I don't know. Now he was also working in a different context, much more locally. It's also local fields. It means hundreds, of course, working in a more international group of the US. He also had to, to change his culture from Germany. This was work through not so much personal interest. Okay. Yeah. One last question. How do we deal with the obsession? <laughs> <laughs> what did I say? What about the obsession? What about oh, your obsession? Was it an obsession? Were you obsessed kind of by Leverance or by his work? Or I mean, it's not so normal, not so natural to study a building for more time than you do for building it, maybe. <coughs> it's very interesting, because we are sometimes obsessed. It's very human. Not obsessed in an insane way, but very much. I'm not obsessed. I'm <laughs> <laughs> very much. Say something else with this question. I think also for students it's very, very open to have a certain passion for something. Also to not, uh, I know that students, for example, like to, to surf around in big studios, go for this profession and then this and try everything. And in the end, you have nothing. I think it's much better to focus on one because in one person that you that you are interested in, that you have a passion for, and uh, to really go through this. And what I did with Clip, I'm not just building something similar, I just decided to go through this, to get to know it, and to, to create a certain basis to afterwards have like a reference where I can react to it, either in a positive way or could also be in a negative way, but that I have something in my background that is like a basis. Any more questions? Mm -hmm.